Thank you, Mace. Welcome, Sangha. Really nice to be with everybody. I'm in a uh, different location. I'm actually, strangely enough, traveling for work again these days. So it's really nice to be in a different location, but with you all. Um, it's really sweet to come home to the Dharma. I'm Eve Ekman, and this evening we will again be moving forward in our Lojong slogans. Tonight is I, I often enjoy the slogans and think they're quite apt. I, this one tonight I find is unbelievably simple. Uh, and it, it just could, I, in some ways, I think it could be the entire path. So how about that for a teaser? We are on slogan 42. Um, before we get started, I am gonna put these reminders in here. Some of you are familiar with this as we've been practicing together online through the pandemic, that in general, but especially in this online format, so helpful for us to keep in mind certain spiritual qualities that really support us arriving here. For many of us, we spend our time in the exact same room where we're eating and working and hanging with our friends and having our spiritual practice. So by kind of invoking these qualities, I, I hope it really helps us transition into this sacred space together. And so these qualities include discipline. And with discipline, this one, it continually blows me away. The discipline isn't how rigid can we be? How regimented can we be? It's how continuously can we adhere ourselves to non-harming? Not beautiful, like how continuously can we sustain an ethos of non-harming? Meaning we're sustaining that goal and aspiration of non-harming, not only in, okay, like here I am sitting, I, I guess, don't think there's any ants here, so I won't harm anything by sitting here. We think of the non-harming even of our body, our speech and our mind. So if we do, like I just did, I had an itch on my forehead and can I even think of, oh, in an effort to not harm my feeling of concern and worry with that scratch, I'm gonna, with that itch. And if I have a feeling of, God, Eva's really, you know, rambling on here with these preliminaries, we bring kindness and non-harming to that. So it's this, this idea of discipline, we really invoke it for this time together, partially because it's unideal. We have all adapted to learn how to be online and yet it's still awkward. And you know, things can happen that are just challenging uh, to our ability to stay focused and stay open. Our next ethos that I invite us to kind of bring to mind the spiritual quality is of generosity. And when I say generosity, it's not just Donna and giving to the center, but the generosity of allowing yourself to fully be here. Now I've uh, disclosed to uh, many here in this Sangha, my own habit of multitasking uh, while I'm on other calls during the work day. My God, that is not a generous way to be with others or with ourselves. It really distracts our attention. So this generosity of, since we are here together, give yourself fully to this space, which doesn't mean also, you know, filling up your Whole Foods cart or looking for your next vacation, right? Just here, and that that's an act of generosity. I also invite, tonight we'll actually focus quite a lot on patience. Some of you know, it's one of my favorite topics. Really can't get that one to start trending, but I'm gonna keep trying. Patience is maybe the most invaluable spiritual quality. It allows us flexibility of body, speech, and mind. We can be patient with the small interruptions, with the feelings of irritation, boredom, fatigue. So bringing patience, especially uh, again to this format, which still for some of us can be a bit awkward. Um, I'm here in a unusual place. I have this unideal light as though I was like emanating from the background here. Um, so can we be patient with, with the conditions that we have online here? We will tonight, uh, towards the end, be doing a bit of work in, um, in a breakout to reflect on some of the uh, like slogans and especially some of the pith aspects around spiritual bypass. 
And when we are in these small groups, we'll have yet another kind of reminder of the way for us to show up that our patience with one another in that too, enormously important. And then last and by no means least, joyful enthusiasm. Oh my gosh, we get to be here. Oh my gosh, we get to receive the Dharma and share. Oh, all in the comfort of our own home. So that is a real reason to feel just that kind of sense of, yeah, wow. Here it is and we get to be here together. Uh, we get to continue and deepen with our work. So those are our slogans to start. And we'll do a meditation now. We've been, last week of course was the Feeding Your Demons practice. I share this incredible space with Lopan Chandra Easton, who some of you know. And we, in our weeks focusing on the slogans, we've been really kind of vacillating between different practices that support the slogans. Some of those practices help us define and refine our attention to create a spaciousness of mind. Other of those practices is that just quintessential capacity to turn towards what's hard. The Tonglen teaching, really transforming adversity into the path itself. Tonight, we're going to do a practice that actually helps us a bit with this patience, with this equanimity. This is a practice in which we follow all of our sensory experiences, but we do so without kind of succumbing to our normal habits and patterns. So generally we might feel like, oh yeah, here's, here's the clothing I'm wearing. Instead of noticing, mm, there's these little nubs and it feels like cotton and, you know, yeah, it's keeping me warm. We're often just, I like it, I don't like it. Oh, I don't like this one. I like that one. How can we experience our senses just in their most bare and simple form? It requires great patience. It actually requires us to slow down and really highlight and refine that ability to notice what is arising as it arises. So we'll turn the searchlight of our attention to sensation, to sound, to what's happening in our visual field, what's happening also in terms of the mind itself and perception. So that will be our practice together. And you know, it is a bit awkward, of course, for us to be looking at a screen. If you would like to show up with your full presence, but you wanna turn your screen so you're facing just to the side, or if you would like to turn down your brightness so you can still hear and be seen, either one of those works well. But let's, let's find our way. And if you're like me, you might be holding some tension in your shoulders. So let's give a try to inhaling our shoulders up to our ears and then exhaling them down our back. Inhaling our shoulders up to our ears and feeling the whole sensation as we exhale at the opening of the chest. One more time. And see if you can find a posture that really gives you a sense of comfort. You can move around slightly, kind of shifting to the left or to the right, forwards and backwards, feeling into just that spot where the spine feels upright. And there's a sense of ease through the front of the body. Find a place for the hands to rest that feels natural and dignified, whether your palms are facing down on your thighs or maybe gently folded in your lap. Bring intention to wherever the hands are placed. very softly and very gently. Invite a cleansing breath throughout the body. Inhaling, slow down just a bit. 
holding at the top for a moment and exhaling slowly and holding at the bottom. We'll repeat this three times. So inhale slowly, bringing in, holding at the top, and then exhale, slowly releasing. And holding at the bottom. Continue on the rhythm of your own breath. Really noticing that moment of holding at the top of the inhale and the top of the exhale. The beautiful silence and stillness of that hold. Just twice more here. Long inhale and hold. Long exhale and hold. Invite a softening and a relaxing through the eyes, both the upper and the lower eyelids. And feel or imagine that your face was as smooth and as calm as that of a sleeping baby. And we'll take a moment here to awaken, to stir our bodhicitta. To consider that our being here and our presence is a direct indication of our desire to be supportive to other beings. When we arouse bodhicitta, we consider how might my presence here be of service. How might my presence like a rock that falls into a still lake radiate out with ripples of goodness, kindness, generosity, and warmth? To help stir and really awaken this bodhicitta, I'll share the lines from part of the bodhisattva prayer and see how they land, how they are experienced in the mind, heart, and body. 
this prayer, of course, is how we adhere ourselves day to day to this impossible task of relieving suffering for all beings. This prayer is like a guiding light, an inspiration. May I be an island for all who need landfall. May I be a lamp for those needing light. May I be a bed for those who deeply need rest. And for those who are sick and suffering, may I be both medicine and doctor. Now shift our practice to highlighting the sense field of what can be experienced through the body at the tactile level. Noticing the sensations of warmth and coolness. Noticing sensations of movement, maybe subtle tingling or heaviness. And as we bring this attention and awareness into the field of the body, see if we can do so with a curiosity without a sense of preference or judgment for whatever we experience. Whenever your mind gets caught up in distraction, thinking, feeling, planning, just relax, release, 
and return with refreshed interest just to the tactile sensations of the body. And then we will gently shift our attention and awareness from this field of the body and move to the sense experience of sound. Of course, in this moment, there's the sound of my voice. And there's also the sound of the room around you. Some of those sounds may be subtle and low and ongoing. Some sounds maybe from the street arise and then pass away. With curiosity and gentleness, noticing sound is just a sound. The more we can relax while maintaining a vivid focus on sound, the, mo the more we may experience subtle and subtle and subtler experiences of background sound. We may also be able to notice quite clearly if a sound arises that we don't like. We feel that contraction, that rejection almost immediately. See if we can slow down that immediacy, noticing the sound as it is, 
and our reaction to it. And again, when a thought, memory, or image arises, gently without forcing and without self-criticism, letting it fall to the background, no need to try to banish or push away. Instead, just refocusing on sound for just a couple more moments. In preparation for our next sensory field, you can bring your chin towards your chest so your gaze with eyes still closed is downward. And as we transition to noticing the experience of sight through the visual field, imagine as though this were your very first time seeing. As you gently Blink open the eyes, perceive the shapes, the colors, the textures, and the subtle movement. As much as possible without judging or labeling or naming, just receive what can be received through this sense portal of sight. Let the gaze be soft, not focused in any one area. Continue relaxing in mind and in body. As we remain here, receiving through the sense portal of sight. Gently blinking the eyes closed once again and returning the head to rest evenly on top of the neck. We now shift to this most wonderful fence portal of mind. 
just as we notice sounds coming and going, sensation shifting and moving. We'll notice thoughts without engaging or energizing them with our attention. So expanding our awareness to this sense portal, the field of the mind, and the thoughts that arise within it. Again, without preference or judgment for what arises in the mind, we notice. If you get caught up in one of the thoughts, memories, or images that arise, completely understandable. And for a couple more moments here, let's lean back in the mind. And simply notice the thoughts arising and passing away. The fantasies that unfold and intrigue. The planning, the ruminating. Gently unhooking, defusing, and watching as though they were shooting stars across the night sky. And slowly finding our way back into the tactile sensations of the breathing body. Re-establishing this ground of breath and body. while still maintaining part of our experience here with the embodied awareness of our sense portals. We'll gently wiggle our fingers and toes, 
and blink our eyes back open and together to our shared space. Thank you all for your practice. Oh, good. You look softer. Good job. <laughs> so before we move to the 42nd slogan, we're actually making our way. We're actually good into 59 after all. Any questions or reflections on that practice? You can raise your hand. Um, you can write in the chat. Thanks, Ted, who says, liked how active and engaged it was for me. Yeah, that, that practice is my is, is one of my favorites. Of course, the, the sense portals and feel that every time it can be quite different. Um, there's something really useful about opening the eyes right before we go to the mind. So we kind of get this brightness of the visual field and the mind feels a bit fresher and present there. Very calming, that's great. You like calm. I teared up when you were reciting the poem at the beginning. Oh yes, it's, um, it's the, yeah, the Bodhisattva prayer. Uh, I agree, it's quite moving. And what I love about that prayer isn't May I go and solve all the world's problems? May I have the strength to do what I want? It's, may I be for others what they need? <laughs> Which sometimes is hard. First, we have to have empathy and, and be able to recognize what they need. We think we need this to be this way or we need it to definitely not be that way. And that Bodhisattva prayer, our dedication to um, the well-being of all, it's really, um, it's really, you know, inviting us to just recognize that if someone's tired, they need a bed. Maybe they don't need a Dharma book. You know, if someone is, you know, struggling and just treading water, they might not need a bed. They might need an island, some landfall, right? So just finding, and it's the same for us. If we truly want to be happy, um, we can't just say, I want to be happy. Okay, where's happy? We actually have to understand the underlying causes and conditions of our own happiness. It requires investigation. Um, Rose is curious where I am. I'm in a undisclosed location in Los Angeles. I'm, I'm working here for the next couple months off and on on a project. So you will see me here, very much related to the Dharma, uh, which is uh, will be released in the fall, let you all know about it when it happens. It's a huge honor to be here um, doing this work, but also such an honor to get to be with you all when I'm far from home. Okay, so this slogan, number 42, and which I, I had the teaser alert of, this might be the entire spiritual path, this poem. Whichever of the two occurs, be patient. And that two is whether it's adversity or felicity, whether it's pleasure or pain, whether it is gain or loss, whether it is praise or blame, 
good reputation or bad reputation. Be patient. And that, you know, I think we could all easily understand the reason to be patient when things are not going well. We want to not react. We, not, we don't want to stir things up and make it worse. But what does this mean to be patient when things are going like well, when things are actually good? And any thoughts? Like, why might we want to be patient when things are actually going well for us? I finally got that job. I'm in a stable relationship. I have this amazing background or whatever, right? right? Whatever it is. Like, why might we be patient when things are actually going well for us? Okay, I see at least Mace and or Pamela and Rachel. Hi folks, it's Pamela. <clears throat> um, this is such a good one for me because um, when I get excited or happy, sometimes um, it kind of breaks me out of that equanimity sort of state that even mm. it, um and it just ruins the co concentration it breaks my mindfulness actually um and carries me away into like delusion which is it's connected i find to um also forgetting impermanence and mm. that, that joyful state will fall away just like the sorrow sorrowful state will um it's interesting i'm just gonna add one thing since we have the mic off for me the patience when things are going well is to actually let things go well because immediately mm. i stay outside i'll be like yeah about climate catastrophe or <laughs> like i'm always waiting for i'm always obsessed with the with the darkness and so when things go well, I think my patience is to actually let them go well, rather mm. than stop the going well by waiting for the other shoe to drop. Mm. Yeah, beautiful. And you guys are actually describing like the same phenomena, right? Just different sides of it. Um, so that, you know, getting caught up in the joyfulness of it is also, you can get caught up in the um, kind of, uh, fragility of it uh, at the same time and both are a form of clinging <laughs> right both are, are holding on yeah thank you so much Rachel thank you hi everyone um yeah this really kind of rings true for me right now um I've been thinking a lot about so I've been uh, going through a process to um, apply for graduate school and I was looking back at my transcripts from college and I didn't realize, like, I couldn't even remember the classes I took or the grades I mm. took because I was just rushing through the process. It was just how to get into the next class and the next units and the, and I didn't, I, 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 I look back and I think I didn't enjoy it and it was going mm. so well for me. And I just was in the next step of get the next class, get the, you know, get the grade. And, and, and I look back at the grades and I was like, whoa. <laughs> so, um, so I kind of, it rings really close to me in terms of like, okay, if I go back to school, I don't want to just go through it again. I want to be patient and be, take my time and enjoy the process of it versus mm. just rushing just to do it something else. It's like, what, what am I doing <laughs> just to rush yeah. through something that I signed up for voluntarily? So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. You're you're actually highlighting yet another slogan. My personal favorite: um, "Give up all hope of fruition." You know this idea that sometimes and and what it points to because sometimes we get so caught up in the, the achievement outcome, we miss out, or we feel despondent and despair. Right? Oh God, it's never going to happen. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for highlighting that and good luck applying for grad school. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And any anyone else on why? And I mean, it seems fairly obvious, but why might we want to be patient when there's pain, when there's adversity and difficulty? How might patience help? Shouldn't we go out and fight to change it? 
what might patience give us? Yes, Sylvia. In that patience, it's like, like elongated the pleasure of thinking, of doing, of thinking. it's putting the time in a proper place hmm. where it doesn't rush away from us. It's like being part of the whole and not going too fast because we are going anywhere. Except, mm. except, except where we are going to go. Beautiful. Yeah, what you're pointing out is um, whether we're patient or not, that's how it's going to go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that, um, as you know, my, my teacher beautifully says, our generosity to life is accepting life as it presents itself to mm. us, which also I think is a real kind of generosity. Yeah. Claudia, yes. I was thinking that to me, patience in, in adverse, adverse times, in a way, now being more aware of impermanence, it gives me hope. Hmm. Because just like joy doesn't last forever, pain doesn't last forever either. So in that sense, I feel kind of like what you just said, you know, accepting it, writing on it and hope that sooner mm -hmm. or later there's going to be an end to whatever phase we're going through which of course it's yeah. easier said than done but yeah but that gives me hope yeah beautiful yeah and again i think you're you're highlighting here why patience is so helpful because patience is what allows us to kind of ride that uh, uncertainty and experience the hope. There's really beautiful writing on this slogan. Um, Diane shared, gosh, many, many months ago, this wonderful website that has all the slogans and, and background and the one of Pema Chodron and her writing on, on patience um, really struck me. She says, patience is not learned in safety. It's not learned when everything is harmonious and going well. There's no cultivation of patience when your pattern is to turn, is to just try to seek harmony and smooth everything out. Patience implies willingness to be alive rather than trying to seek harmony. That's pretty intense, right? That last one. Patience implies a willingness to be alive rather than trying to seek harmony. It's almost as though there's like a, a courage required to us in having patience instead of, and you know, we think of harmony as a good thing and she's not saying that harmony is bad, but this idea of, um, you know, I, I don't know, I don't know about you all, but my most common content in meditation when my mind slips away is planning. And the planning for me is about safety. And the safety is about trying to create somewhere in the future where I'm safe that isn't here. And it's not very patient. Planning's great. It's gotten me far in life. I appreciate it. And yet, if it can't rest even during my practice, obviously there's a bit too much energy in that. I wouldn't call it seeking harmony. I would call it trying to control things. <laughs> But that's a really euphemistic, nice way, right? Trying to make things fit in a way that works for me it takes a lot of energy. And it's really not patient. And, you know, one thing I definitely notice is, is patience actually saves time. It sounds boring and that it's going to take longer. But actually our patience allows things to unfold in ways that they actually want to unfold. Jamie, I see your head nodding. Have you had an experience of patience saving you time? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah, no. my experience oh, with patience has, has been 
Well, my experience with inpatients has been every time, particularly in adv adverse situations when I've acted out of inpatients, I've just made the situation worse. Yeah. Yeah. And there's also this kind of agitated energy often. Impatience. We all know what that feels like. Impatience is in the anger family, right? That is a frustrated something's in my way. Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, one facet of patience that's related to what we've been talking about is patience and speech. Mm. And, and, you know, wanting to say something and then thinking to, I mean, I guess it's part of um, skillful speech, right? Or right speech is, is it timely? Is it necessary? You know, those require patience. Like, it may feel like you want to say it. And it may be better not to and sometimes it's good to i'm i'm someone who tends to err on the side of not saying enough so you kind of have mm. to know your tendencies right but sometimes i'll be thinking something and then later i'll be like yeah i i really didn't need to say that i mean and not say it and and then it and it and it works out fine without my having said it you know mm. yeah i love bringing that to speech it is true it's um I think it's Lao Tzu who says like one word said in anger can cause a thousand years of um, suffering, right? You know, kind of this. Wow. Yeah, yeah, it's a little heavy, but you know, this idea that we can really create a lot of harm without having that patience. And um, again, you know, if we define patience, if patience in, in the contemporary term in the West um, really has this idea of, rigidity and of kind of like a kind of withdrawn way of being in the world. But actually, you know, um, the way that Alan Wallace describes it is that patience is about courage. You know, really facing the fear, being able to not react in the situation in the moment, not say the thing, not do the thing. And that that patience, um, he says, it is the inner courage that is a ballast for your vessel of life. So the ballast, right, it's the main part of the ship. So patience is really the kind of centering force for us, which, yeah, is quite interesting. Um, and so, you know, one thing I, I want us to, to think of tonight in, in related to, to this slogan is, well, yeah, what gets in the way of our patience? Or maybe how do we in some ways um, not see clearly? And in one of the um, teachings around this slogan, there's a, a really a kind of a, a quote of a famous passage of, of teaching by Patrol Rinpoche. Some of you may know uh, Patrol Rinpoche for his book, uh, In the Words of My Perfect Teacher, really lovely Dharma book. Um, and Patrol Rinpoche, supposedly this famous story is you know, he went to visit a yogi who had been meditating on patience for 10 years. And he goes into this little yogi's hut, kind of gets in his face and says, yeah, you're practicing on patience. Good one. Yeah. Everyone thinks probably you're so great. You get all the gifts and they come by, but we really know you're just doing it to have fun, right? It's not. And this yogi just gets so upset, like, get out of here. Stop bothering me. And of course, Pacho Rinpoche is like, ah, where is your practice? And there's many versions of this kind of teaching, right? That when we remove ourselves, when we go to the cave or to our you know, protected environment and try to practice, that we might not even be aware of the ways our patient still needs perfecting, that we might actually um, in some ways not see it. And that story, especially when, you know, I was looking at that story, it just reminded me of um, the hazards of spiritual bypass and how we can inadvertently use our practice to avoid some of the real necessary suffering we have to work through to advance on our path. And I, I don't think we've talked explicitly about spiritual bypass. I, I thought it might be worthwhile um, given this um, 
this slogan to to dig into it and you know spiritual bypass is a term actually that was coined by john wellwood who was the partner of um, of my teacher in the in the 80s and he really noticed in the 80s so imagine you know this is a time in which there was many spiritual teachers coming over from um, east asia and many people going to east asia uh, the kind of big you know I'd say first wave of interest in Buddhism in the 70s. And a lot of people were leaving their life in order to pursue the spiritual path. And then in that, they inadvertently kind of looked back on their life as an obstacle to the spiritual path. Like, oh yeah, I used to have a job and a refrigerator and responsibilities. And now I'm free. Now I'm practicing yeah, keeping your, you know, keeping your food stocked and your house clean, what a drag. All that stuff's just gonna get in the way of my spiritual practice. And I don't think we are in that era of Dharma anymore. I actually think we've, we've kind of, um, many of us really been able to see that there are no barriers in our Dharma. It's not like, oh yeah, I go to work and there I'm doing the work thing. And then I come home and I can do Dharma. Like, our whole life, right? Our whole life is the practice. Um, and yet this kind of temptation to spiritual bypass, it can be very strong. One thing John Wellwood points out is, um, he actually has this quote I really love. He says, I see relationship as the leading edge of human evolution at this time in history. So I see relationship as the leading edge of human evolution at this time in history. Although humanity discovered enlightenment thousands of years ago, we still haven't brought that illumination very fully into the area of interpersonal relationship. Key things are bypassing, we see it primarily within our relationships. So that could look like just saying like, oh, well, you know, you know, Eve said, be patient. So even though I'm not getting the love I need, I'm just going to be patient and, you know, avoid my very real human needs because <laughs> that's not very Buddhist to want things. Or, you know, I'm, um, I'm feeling, you know, so much joy and just so much presence of, of love, but gosh, I don't want to get attached to it. So I'm just going to try to negate it and put it down in my head. And so we, we accidentally use spiritual practice to kind of, I don't know the best term, we can either suppress, deny, avoid, in some ways just kind of subvert our other psych, kind of unmetabolized psychological pain, or our, our unmet needs. Now that doesn't mean, okay, let's stop practicing. Uh, let's just focus on, um, you know, building our relationships. We need to do both. We definitely need to do both. But I think it is really important for us to consider, yeah, like where are the areas in our life, especially in our relationships, where we're bypassing? So I'm curious when, when people hear about spiritual bypass and they hear about it specifically in this context of relationship, what comes up? What thoughts? What clarifications? Do people have a good feel for what spiritual bypass means? So there's like a, a bridge here, right? When we think of cultivating our patience, it seems to me a bit of the opposite of a spiritual bypass. Like we, we can't tolerate what's happening. We can't tolerate the reality. We don't want to bring wisdom and compassion to our psychological content. So we just kind of find a way to avoid. So we can think of many different ways of bypassing. We could use Netflix, we could use alcohol, uh, being busy, right? We can bypass our difficult, challenging, relational experiences in many ways. And we can use spiritual practice just the same. Nothing special about spiritual practice that allows us to bypass.
So I want to um, um, I want to remind us here. One moment. I'm gonna copy and paste something. Okay. Uh, these are these are some of these really helpful instructions for us to think about um, in doing a, a breakout group. So it's it is wonderful for us to practice and reflect and meditate, really develop the tools and skills. But our initial practice was really one of equanimity. It's also wonderful to listen to the teachings and think about it. And yet, when we speak about it to one another when we apply these practices, just a whole other level of accountability we hold ourselves to. Um, I appreciate and recognize that we, we might lose some people and that's totally okay. Um, and I just really wanna ensure and um, celebrate those of you who wanna stay for the breakout. I think it's such a meaningful way. And, and tonight we're gonna use a specific format I've, I've taught before where instead of it being an open dialogue, my invitation is that we do this breakout almost as though it's an audio diary. So if I was with Jenny and Claudia, each of us would take a full two minutes and just speak to the prompt that I'll share. And so one person would be timing and the other person speaking and at the end you can discuss. So we're using this time not just to be in casual conversation, which I love casual conversation, but we're using this as its own reflective spiritual practice. And what I put in the chat so far is just some things to keep in mind. Uh, we've been doing some of these groups online now for a while. So hopefully this is familiar. When you are talking with others, practice self-focus. And that means, you know, really just talk about your own experience. Definitely try to avoid giving suggestions or telling others how they should feel or what they should do, even if it's coming from a good place. Be really mindful in your listening. Be curious, be compassionate, be open. Remember confidentiality, right? Whatever is shared just in your group, not to this bigger group or to anyone else. And, you know, in general, I think in our bigger group, we can thinking of moving up and standing back, letting all voices be heard. And um, always, and this is true even in the breakout, total right to pass. You can say, hey, I'd rather, uh, I'd rather listen here. So I'm gonna put the instructions in the chat and I invite you to, to copy them so you have it. I'm gonna ask everyone to say your name and where you're joining from. And whoever is farthest from the mission district, which is spiritual home of the Dharma Collective, uh, you will be the first person to start. Ideally breakouts of about three, if that's okay. Great. Um, so the person who is farthest will be the first person and the person who's closest to the mission will be the timekeeper. And as you're talking, keep 40% of your attention outward to what you're saying, but actually see if you can keep like 60% of your attention inward, meaning really talking from a place of being grounded and dropped in, really reporting from your experience instead of like, hey, Mace, you know how I bypass like that way and I do this, like actually coming from, wow, when I think of spiritual bypass, okay. Yeah, well, I think I'm not really recognizing my need for love. I'm saying it's okay, right? So really kind of a discovery process. And each person sharing without interruption for two minutes and then coming back together to discuss after each person has shared for three minutes. So that would be two, four, six. So 10 minute breakout or so, we'll, we'll give 11, maybe 12, just to give it a little padding. And the prompt is um, share on spiritual bypass and where practice might prevent us from the work we need to do. Or if that's not really like coming up for you, where can we have more patience um, in our relationships? Sorry, the last part didn't get copied there. Okay. So we'll do that. Yeah, just about. 15 minutes and come back together for a closing practice and discussion. Ready to go? Okay.
You've been invited. <clears throat> oh, look. Oh, Jason stays. Hi, guys. Okay. Hi. So we have one room with two people. Oh, That's shit. Okay. I'm going to move somewhere. No, because they're Rachel and Lindsay, so they're technically three. Do you know if Gina and Sylvia were, were on it together? Yeah. Still One other. 